Part fifteen of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part fifteen, the Earl of Kilmarnock and Lord Balmerino, beheaded for high treason. A short account of the circumstances attending the rebellion of seventeen fifteen, having been given in this work, some notice will doubtless be expected of the second transaction of the same character, and with the same object, which occurred in the year 1745. It appears that the pretender having gained the protection of France, and the French also having their own interests to serve, it was determined that a second attempt to restore the Stuarts to the throne of England should be made by the descent of a body of men upon Scotland, where it was conjectured numbers would render assistance which was eventually to march forward towards London, and expel the reigning monarch. The design was evidently known to the government, from an allusion made to the circumstance by the king in his speech from the throne on the 2nd of May, 1745. But the first notice which the British public had of the proceedings of the pretender was from a paragraph in the General Evening Post, which said, The pretender's eldest son put to sea, July 14th, from France, in an armed ship of sixty guns, provided with a large quantity of warlike stores, together with a frigate of thirty guns, and a number of smaller armed vessels, in order to land in Scotland, where he expected to find twenty thousand men in arms, to make good his father's pretensions to the crown of Great Britain. He was to be joined by five ships of the line from Brest, and four thousand five hundred Spaniards were embarking at Ferrol. The government, it appears, was not inactive on this occasion, and proper instructions were given to such of the king's vessels as were cruising in the channel, to prevent the approach of any ships which might be supposed to carry the leader of this rebellious attempt. The young pretender, followed by about fifty Scotch and Irish adventurers, meanwhile came incognito through Normandy, and embarked on board a ship of war of eighteen guns, which was joined off Belle Isle by the Elizabeth and other ships. They intended to have sailed northwards, and to have landed in Scotland, but on the 20th they came up with an English fleet of merchant vessels, under convoy of the Lion Man of War, of fifty-eight guns, commanded by Captain Brett, who immediately bore down upon the French line of battleship, which he engaged within pistol-shot five hours, being constantly annoyed by the smaller ships of the enemy. The rigging of the Lion was cut to pieces, her mizzen-mast, mizzen topmast, main yard, and fore topsail were shot away. All her lower masts and topmast shot through in many places, so that she lay muzzled on the sea and could do nothing with her sails. Thus situated, the French ships sheered off, and the Lion could make no effort to follow them. Captain Brett had forty-five men killed, himself, all his lieutenants, the master, several midshipmen, and one hundred and seven foremast men wounded. His principal antagonist, the Elizabeth with difficulty got back to Brest, quite disabled, and had sixty-four men killed, one hundred and thirty-nine dangerously wounded, and a number more slightly injured. She had on board four hundred thousand pounds sterling, and arms and ammunition for several thousand men. The friends of the Stuart cause in Scotland were in the meantime as active as their opponents, and committed many irregularities, for the purpose of supplying their ranks with a sufficient number of soldiers, and, being thus prepared, anxiously expected the arrival of their prince. The latter found means to join his supporters by a small vessel, in which he quitted the French coast, and eluding the vigilance of the English cruisers, he landed on the Isle of Skye, opposite to Loch Arbour, in the county of Inverness. After a lapse of about three weeks, he appeared at the head of a body of two thousand men, under a standard bearing the motto, Tandem Triumphans, at length triumphant and marching his army to Fort William, he there published a manifesto, signed by his father at Rome, containing many promises to those who would adhere to his cause, among which were undertakings that he would procure the dissolution of the union of the two kingdoms, and the payment of the national debt. The country people flocked in great numbers to his standard, and the mob, by which he was followed, soon assumed the appearance, in numbers at least, of an army. Their first attempt in arms, in opposition to two companies of foot, of the St. Clair and Murray's regiments, was successful, the soldiers being far inferior in numbers, and the rebels immediately marched upon Perth, and having taken possession of that place, the pretender issued his orders for all persons who held public money to pay it into the hands of his secretary, 
Dundee and Dunblane were successively seized by his soldiers, and at length, on the 14th of September, the pretender proceeded through the Royal Park and took possession of Holyrood House. The money in the Bank of Edinburgh and the records in the public offices were now removed to the castle for security, and the gates of the city were kept fast during the whole day, but five hundred of the rebels, having concealed themselves in the suburbs, took an opportunity, at four o'clock in the morning, to follow a coach which was going in, and seizing the gate called the Netherbow, they maintained their ground, while the main body reached the centre of the city and formed themselves in the Parliament close. Thus possessed of the Scottish capital, they seized two thousand stand of arms, and on the following day marched to oppose the royal army under the command of General Cope. The two armies coming in sight of each other, near Preston Pans, on the evening of the 20th, Colonel Gardiner earnestly recommended it to the general to attack his opponents during the night. But, deaf to this advice, he kept the men under arms till morning, though they were already greatly harassed. At five in the morning the rebels made a furious attack on the royal army, which was thrown into unspeakable confusion by two regiments of dragoons falling back on the foot. Colonel Gardiner, with five hundred foot, behaved with uncommon valour, and covered the retreat of those who fled. But the colonel receiving a mortal wound, the rebels made prisoners of nearly all the rest of the king's troops. The loss thus sustained by the royal army was three hundred killed, four hundred and fifty wounded, five hundred and twenty taken prisoners, total one thousand two hundred and seventy, while the rebels only lost fifty men in all. Flushed with this partial victory, the rebels returned to Edinburgh to make an attack upon the castle, and attempted to throw up an entrenchment upon the hill. But notice having been given to the inhabitants to retire, the battery was attacked by the guns from above, the works destroyed, and thirty of the assailants killed, besides three of the inhabitants who rashly ventured near the spot. The rebel army remained during seven weeks in this city, and many noblemen and gentlemen with their followers having joined it, a force of more than ten thousand men was at length mustered. In November they marched upon Carlisle, and after some resistance had been shown, it was surrendered, and the insurgents then forced their way into Manchester, where a regiment, chiefly formed of Roman Catholics, was raised. But now such decisive measures were taken as put an end very shortly to the insurrection. The Duke of Cumberland was at the time in Flanders, with the army, but being sent for thence, he soon arrived to take the command of the royal forces. About the time he reached London, the rebels had advanced as far as Derby, but His Royal Highness lost no time in travelling into Staffordshire, where he collected all the force he could to stop their farther inroads into the kingdom. Liverpool had not been behind London in spirit and loyalty. The inhabitants contributed largely in assisting the royal army at this inclement season with warm clothing, and raised several companies of armed men which were called the Royal Liverpool Blues. Some of the advance parties of rebels, having appeared in sight of the town, Every preparation was made to resist them, but finding at length that the pretender bent his march by another route for Manchester, the Liverpool Blues marched in order to destroy the bridges, and thereby impede their progress. Notwithstanding these impediments, the rebels crossed the Mersey at different fords, through which the pretender waded breast-high in water. Their numbers could not be accurately ascertained, their march being straggling and unequal, but about nine thousand appeared to be the aggregate. Their train of artillery consisted of sixteen field pieces of three and four pound shot, two carriages of gunpowder, a number of covered wagons, and about one hundred horses laden with ammunition. Their vanguard consisted of about two hundred cavalry, badly mounted, the horses appearing poor and jaded. The pretender himself constantly marched on foot, at the head of the two regiments, one of which was appropriated as his bodyguard. His dress was a light plaid, belted about with a sash of blue silk. He wore a grey wig with a blue bonnet and a white rose in it, and appeared very dejected at this time. His followers were ordinary, except the two regiments mentioned, which appeared to have been picked out of the whole. The arms of the others were very indifferent. Some had guns, others only pistols. The remainder broadswords and targets. In order to deceive the Duke of Cumberland, all sorts of reports as to the future route of the rebels were sent abroad, but the King's troops were concentrated at Northampton a spot well suited for the purpose, as it was the road which it was most probable would be taken in the event of the pretender advancing upon London, which was known to be his real intention. Meanwhile the rebels appeared unconscious of the danger they were bringing upon themselves by delay, 
and they remained during a considerable time endeavouring to raise recruits. They at length, however, set forward on their march southward, but they had not advanced more than a mile before they halted, held a consultation, wheeled around, and retraced their steps to Derby. Having there seized all the plunder they could lay their hands upon, they passed on, seeking to regain Scotland, where they had learned that their friends had been joined by some French troops. The Duke of Cumberland, in the meantime, being aware of their flight, followed them with all speed, and learning that they had been compelled to halt at Preston from excessive weariness, he redoubled his efforts to come up with them. By forced marches, travelling through ice and snow, he succeeded in reaching Preston in three days, but he found that his game had retired about four hours before him. The pretender soon learned that the excesses, of which his men had been guilty in their southward march, were not to go unpunished, and wherever he went he found himself opposed and harassed by the enraged country people, who lost no opportunity of annoying him in his retreat, and of seizing the stragglers from his army. At length, however, after repeated forced marches, the Duke of Cumberland came up with his antagonists at Lowther Hall, and the latter, dreading his approach, immediately threw themselves into the village of Clifton, three miles from Penrith. They were there attacked most vigorously and successfully by the dragoons, who had dismounted, and in about an hour's time they were driven away from the post which they occupied. They retreated forthwith to Carlisle, which was still in their possession, but the continued advance of the royal troops induced them again to retire, leaving only a garrison to oppose the entry of the Duke into that city. The besieged fired upon their assailants with great fury, but did little execution, and at length a battery, having been raised against them, they sent out a flag of truce, and surrendered upon terms that they should not be put to the sword, but reserved for the king's pleasure, and thus Carlisle was once more taken possession by the troops of his majesty. The army of rebels made the best of their way now to Glasgow, where they levied contributions, and thence to Stirling, which was in possession of the English, and was commanded by the gallant General Blakeney. The gates could not be defended, and they therefore marched on, and summoned the garrison to surrender, but the veteran commander answered that he would perish in its ruins rather than make terms with rebels. In the river of the town were two English men of war, and the rebels, in order to prevent their going farther up, erected a battery, but the ships soon destroyed it, and caused them to retreat a mile, where they erected another but did little execution. They now prepared for a vigorous attack upon the castle, got some heavy pieces of ordnance across the fourth, erected a battery against it, and called in all their forces. General Blakeney fired upon them, and repeatedly drove them from their works. General Hawley, in aid of his brother general, at the head of such troops as he could form, in order of battle, marched to attempt to raise the siege, but the rebels made a desperate attack, and, aided by accident, obtained the advantage. Repeated skirmishes subsequently took place, but at length this system of warfare, so destructive to the general state of the country, was terminated by the decisive victory gained by the Duke of Cumberland at the head of the royal forces at the Battle of Culloden. The pretender at the head of his army opposed the Duke, and the following taken from the London Gazette is the conqueror's account of the battle. On Tuesday the 15th of April the rebels burnt Fort Augustus, which convinced us of their resolution to stand an engagement with the King's troops. We gave our men a day's halt at Nairn, and on the 16th marched from thence, between four and five, in four columns. The three lines of foot, reckoning the reserve for one, were broken into three from the right, which made the three columns equal, and each of five battalions. The artillery and baggage followed the first column upon the right, and the cavalry made the fourth column on the left. After we had marched about eight miles, our advance guard, composed of about forty of Kingston's and the Highlanders, led by the quartermaster-general, perceived the rebels at some distance, making a motion towards us on the left, upon which we immediately formed, but finding the rebels were still a good way from us, we put ourselves again upon our march in our former posture, and continued it to within a mile of them, where we formed in the same order as before. After reconnoitring their situation, we found them posted behind some old walls and huts, in a line with Culloden House. As we thought our right was entirely secure, General Hawley and General Bland went to the left with two regiments of dragoons to endeavour to fall upon the right flank of the rebels, and Kingston's horse was ordered to the reserve. The ten pieces of cannon were disposed, two in each of the intervals of the first line, 
and all our Highlanders, except 140, which were upon the left with General Hawley, and who behaved extremely well, were left to guard the baggage. When we were advanced within five hundred yards of the rebels, we found the morass upon our right was ended, which left our right flank quite uncovered to them. His Royal Highness thereupon immediately ordered Kingston's horse from the reserve, and a little squadron of about sixty of Cobham's, which had been patrolling, to cover our flank. We spent about half an hour after that trying which should gain the flank of the other, and His Royal Highness having sent Lord Berry forward, within a hundred yards of the rebels, to reconnoitre something that appeared like a battery to us, they thereupon began firing their cannon, which was extremely ill-pointed and ill-served. Ours answered them, which began their confusion. They then came running on, in their wild manner, and upon the right, where His Royal Highness had placed himself, imagining the greatest push would be there, they came down three several times within a yard of our men, firing their pistols, and brandishing their swords, but the royals and Pulteneys hardly took their firelocks from their shoulders, so that after those first attempts they made off, and the little squadrons on our right were sent to pursue them. General Hawley had, by the help of our Highlanders, beat down two little stone walls, and came in upon the right flank of their second line. As their whole body came down to attack at once, their right somewhat outflanked Burrell's regiment, which was our left, and the greatest part of the little loss we sustained was there. But Blyes and Simples, giving a fire upon those who had outflanked Burrell's, soon repulsed them, and the Burrell's regiment, and the left of Monroe's, fairly beat them with their bayonets. There was scarce a soldier or officer of Burrell's, and of that part of Monroe's, which engaged, who did not kill one or two men each with their bayonets and spontoons. Footnote. The officer's half-pikes. End of footnote. The cavalry which had charged from the right and left met in the centre, except two squadrons of dragoons, which we missed, and they were gone in pursuit of the runaways. Lord Ancrum was ordered to pursue with the horse as far as he could, and did it with so good effect that a very considerable number was killed in the pursuit. As we were on our march to Inverness, and were nearly arrived there, Major General Bland sent the annexed papers, which he received from the French officers and soldiers, surrendering themselves prisoners to His Royal Highness. Major General Bland had also made great slaughter, and took about fifty French officers and soldiers prisoner in his pursuit. By the best calculation that can be made, it is thought the rebels lost two thousand men upon the field of battle and in the pursuit. We have here one hundred and twenty-two French, and three hundred and twenty-six rebel prisoners. Lieutenant Colonel Howard killed an officer, who appeared to be Lord Strathallan, by the seal and different commissions from the pretender found in his pocket. It is said that Lord Perth, Lords Nairn, Lochiel, Keppock, and Appin Stewart are also killed. All their artillery and ammunition were taken, as well as the pretenders, and all their baggage. There were also twelve colours taken. All the generals, officers, and soldiers did their utmost duty in His Majesty's service, and showed the greatest zeal and bravery on this occasion. The pretender's son, it is said, lay at Lord Lovett's house at Aird the night after the action. Brigadier Mordaunt is detached with nine hundred volunteers this morning into the Fraser's country, to attack all the rebels he may find there. Lord Sutherland's and Lord Rees' people continue to exert themselves, and have taken upwards of one hundred rebels, who were sent for, and there is a great reason to believe Lord Cromarty and his son are also taken. The Monroes have killed fifty of the rebels in their flight. As it is not known where the greatest bodies of them are, or which way they have taken in their flight, His Royal Highness has not yet determined which way to march. On the 17th, as His Royal Highness was at dinner, three officers, and about sixteen of Fitzjames' regiment, who were mounted, came and surrendered themselves prisoners. The killed, wounded, and missing of the King's troops amounted to above three hundred. The French officers will all be sent to Carlisle, till His Majesty's pleasure shall be known. The rebels, by their own accounts, made their loss greater by two thousand men, that we have stated it. Four of their principal ladies are in custody, viz. Lady Ogilvy, Lady Kinlock, Lady Gordon, and the Laird of Mackintosh's wife. Major Grant, the Governor of Inverness, is retaken, and the Generals Hawley, Lord Albemarle, Husk, and Bland have orders to inquire into the reasons for his surrendering of Fort George. Lord Cromarty, Lord MacLeod, his son, 
with other prisoners, are just brought in from Sutherland by the Hound Sloop, which His Royal Highness has sent for them, and they are just now landing. Soon after this affair, several other rebel chiefs were taken into custody, and on the 28th of July, 1746, at about eight o'clock in the morning, the rebel lords were taken from the Tower to Westminster Hall to be tried by their peers. The Earl of Kilmarlock and the Earl of Cromarty pleaded guilty, but Lord Balmerino, having denied the offence imputed to him, six witnesses were called, by whom his guilt was clearly established, and a verdict was returned accordingly. On the 1st of August the peers were brought up for judgment, when the Lord High Steward pronounced sentence of death, in terms very like those used in the case of Earl Cowper, after the former rebellion. Great interest being exerted to save the earls, it was hinted to Balmerino that his friends ought to exert themselves on his behalf, to which, with great magnanimity, he only replied, I am very indifferent about my own fate, but had the two noble earls been my friends, they would have squeezed my name in among theirs. The Countess of Cromarty, who had a very large family of young children, was incessant in her applications for the pardon of her husband, to obtain which she took a very plausible method. She procured herself to be introduced to the late Princess of Wales, attended by her children in mourning, and urged her suit in the most suppliant terms. The Princess had at that time several children. Such an argument could scarcely fail to move, and a pardon was granted to Lord Cromarty, on the condition that he should never reside north of the River Trent. This condition was literally complied with, and his lordship died in Soho Square in the year 1766. On the 18th of August, 1746, at six o'clock in the morning, a troop of lifeguards, one of horse grenadiers, and one thousand of the foot guards, marched from the parade in St. James's Park, through the city to Tower Hill, to attend the execution of the Earl of Kilmarnock and Lord Balmerino, and, being arrived there, were posted in lines from the tower to the scaffold, and all round it. About eight o'clock the sheriffs of London, with their under-sheriffs and officers, met at the Mitre Tavern in Fenchurch Street, where they breakfasted, and went from thence to the house, lately the transport office, Tower Hill, where they remained until the necessary preparations for the execution were made. At eleven o'clock they demanded the bodies of the peers of the constable of the tower, and they were directly brought forth in procession, followed by mourning coaches and two hearses. The lords were conducted into separate apartments in the house, facing the steps of the scaffold, their friends being admitted to see them. The Earl of Kilmarnock was attended by the Reverend Mr. Foster, a dissenting minister, and the Reverend Mr. Hume, a near relation of the Earl of Hume. The chaplain of the Tower, and another clergyman of the Church of England, accompanied the Lord Balmerino. The latter, on entering the door of the house, hearing several of the spectators ask eagerly, "'Which is Lord Balmerino?' answered, smiling, "'I am Lord Balmerino, gentlemen, at your service.' The parlour and passage of the house, the rails enclosing the way from thence to the scaffold, and the rails about it, were all hung with black at the sheriff's expense. Lord Kilmarnock, in the apartment allotted to him, spent about an hour in his devotions with Mr. Foster, who assisted him with prayer and exhortation, after which Lord Balmerino, pursuant to his request, was admitted to confer with the Earl. After a short conversation relating to some report as to the pretender's orders at the Battle of Culloden, they separated, the Lord Balmerino saluting the noble Earl with the same high-minded courtesy which had been before remarked in him. The Earl of Kilmarnock then joined in prayer with those around him, and afterwards he took some refreshment. He expressed a wish that Lord Balmerino should go to the scaffold first, but being informed that this was impossible, as he was named first in the warrant, he immediately acquiesced in the arrangement which had been made, and, with his friends, proceeded to the place of execution. There was an immense crowd collected, and on their seeing him they exhibited the greatest commiseration and pity the earl being struck with a variety of dreadful objects which presented themselves to him at once exclaimed to mr hume this is terrible but he exhibited no sign of fear nor did he even change countenance or tremble in his voice after putting up a short prayer concluding with a petition for his majesty king george and the royal family his lordship embraced and took leave of his friends the executioner was so affected by the awfulness of the scene that on his asking pardon of the prisoner he burst into tears. The noble earl, however, bid him take courage, and presenting him with five guineas, told him that he would drop his handkerchief as a signal to him to strike. 
He then proceeded, with the help of these gentlemen, to make ready for the block, by taking off his coat and the bag from his hair, which was then tucked up under a napkin cap. His neck being laid bare, tucking down the collar of his shirt and waistcoat, he kneeled down on a black cushion at the block, and drew his cap over his eyes, and in doing this, as well as in putting up his hair, his hands were observed to shake. Either to support himself, or for a more convenient posture of devotion, he happened to lay both his hands upon the block, which the executioner observing, prayed his lordship to let them fall, lest they should be mangled or break the blow. He was then told that the neck of his waistcoat was in the way, upon which he rose, and with the help of a friend took it off, and the neck being made bare to the shoulders, he kneeled down as before. In the meantime, when all things were ready for the execution, and the black baize which hung over the rails of the scaffold had, by direction of the colonel of the guard, or the sheriffs, been turned up, that the people might see all the circumstances of the execution, in about two minutes after he kneeled down, his lordship dropped his handkerchief, and the executioner at once severed his head from his body, except only a small part of the skin, which was immediately divided by a gentle stroke. His head was received in a piece of red baize, and with the body immediately put into the coffin. The scaffold was then cleared from the blood, fresh sawdust strewed, and that no appearance of a former execution might remain, the executioner changed such of his clothes as appeared bloody. While this was doing, the Lord Balmerino, after having solemnly recommended himself to the mercy of the Almighty, conversed cheerfully with his friends, refreshed himself twice with a bit of bread and a glass of wine, and desired the company to drink to him, acquainting them that he had prepared a speech which he should read on the scaffold, and therefore should now say nothing of its contents. The under-sheriff coming into his lordship's apartment to let him know the stage was ready, he prevented him by immediately asking if the affair was over with the Lord Kilmarnock, and being answered, It is, he inquired how the executioner had performed his office. Upon receiving the account, he said, It was well done, and then addressing himself to the company, said, Gentlemen, I shall detain you no longer, and with an easy, unaffected cheerfulness, saluted his friends and hastened to the scaffold, which he mounted with so unconstrained an air as astonished the spectators. His lordship was dressed in his regimentals, a blue coat, turned up with red, trimmed with brass buttons, the same which he wore at the Battle of Culloden. No circumstance in his whole deportment showed the least sign of fear or regret, and he frequently reproved his friends for discovering either upon his account. He walked several times round the scaffold, bowed to the people, went to his coffin, read the inscription, and with a nod said, It is right. He then examined the block, which he called his pillow of rest, his lordship putting on his spectacles and taking a paper out of his pocket, read it with an audible voice. But so far from its being filled with passionate invectives, it mentioned his majesty as a prince of the greatest magnanimity and mercy, at the same time that, through erroneous political principles, it denied him a right to the allegiance of his people. Having delivered this paper to the sheriff, he called for the executioner, and on his being about to ask his lordship's pardon, he said, "'Friend, you need not ask me forgiveness. The execution of your duty is commendable.' Upon this his lordship gave him three guineas, saying, "'I never was rich. This is all the money I have now. I wish it was more, and I am sorry I can add nothing to it but my coat and waistcoat,' which he then took off, together with his neckcloth, and threw them on his coffin, putting on a flannel waistcoat which had been provided for the purpose.' and then, taking a plaid cap out of his pocket, he put it on his head, saying he died a Scotchman. After kneeling down at the block to adjust his posture, and show the executioner the signal for the stroke, which was dropping his arms, he once more gave a farewell look to his friends, and turning round on the crowd, he said, "'Perhaps some may think my behaviour too bold, but remember, sir,' to a gentleman who stood near him, "'that I now declare it is the effect of a confidence in God,' and a good conscience, and I should dissemble if I showed any signs of fear. Having observed the axe in the executioner's hand as he passed him, he now took it from him, felt the edge, and returning it, clapped the executioner on the shoulder to encourage him. He even tucked down the collar of his shirt and waistcoat, and showed him where to strike, desiring him to do it resolutely, for in that, says his lordship, will consist your kindness. He afterwards went to the side of the stage, 
and called upon the warder, of whom he inquired which was his hearse, and ordered the man to drive near, which was instantly done. Immediately, without trembling or changing countenance, he again kneeled down at the block, and having with his arms stretched out, said, O Lord, reward my friends, forgive my enemies, and receive my soul. He gave the signal by letting them fall. But his uncommon firmness and intrepidity, with the unexpected suddenness of the signal, so surprised the executioner, that, though he struck the part directed, the blow was not given with strength enough to wound him very deeply. It was observed that he moved as if he made an effort to turn his head towards the executioner, and the under jaw fell, and returned very quick like anger and gnashing the teeth, but this arose from the parts being convulsed, and a second blow immediately succeeding the first rendered him quite insensible, and a third finished the work. His head was received in a piece of red baize, and with his body put into a coffin, which, at his particular request, together with that of the Earl of Kilmarnock, was placed on that of the late Marquis of Tully Bodine, who died during his imprisonment, in St. Peter's Church, in the Tower, all three lords lying in one grave. End of part 15